Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about our diesel fuel. So I'm on slide number four. Do I have any questions? All right, good. Good discussions, you guys. I'm liking this. So diesel fuel ratings and classifications, we have number 1D, we have number 2D, and we have died. All right? Um, <clears throat> the only difference between dyed fuel and non-dyed fuel is basically food coloring. Okay? All, everything else with them, the cetane number, the parts per million of sulfur, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is exactly the same. All they do with dyed fuel is put food coloring in it to dye it red. Okay? And sell it cheaper. To, if you are, yes, they do, because the taxes aren't there. <laughs> right. But, you know what? <clears throat> Don't ever, ever get caught on the highway <laughs> with dyed fuel. Okay? This is probably, you know, and I know a lot of farmers uh, who run dyed fuel on the highway. Number one, they're robbing you and me of the taxes, all right? Number two, first time they get caught, and I know this because I asked a highway patrol about this, first time they get caught with dyed fuel on highway is a $5,000 fine and it's a civil offense. Second time they get caught, it is a criminal offense and it is possibly a $10,000 fine with the option of their vehicle getting confiscated. And the Highway Patrol officer said they do not want to get caught a third time. All right, they will be going to jail, serious fine, and they will lose their vehicle, okay? Now you've probably got some ag producers who do a lot of running on highway with, with dyed fuel, right? So if you know of that, just kind of turn a blind eye, just plead ignorance or whatever, but you might want to mention to them that it's probably not a good idea to do that. Okay. So my understanding was always that the dyed fuel <coughs> offer was different, but that's no, not the case. No, it's all the same. Federal regulations is 15 parts per million of sulfur. Uh, number one fuel, number two fuel, dyed, undyed, doesn't matter. And undyed, which is, as we know, is clear fuel, so it's clear diesel, okay? Back in the day, I think it was um, up until 2004, we had 500 parts per million of sulfur. And so that is actually a regulated uh, noxious emission. So that had to come out. So they went from 500, 2004, to 30. And you find that we had a lot of issues, and probably a lot of your um, producers had this issue too, that we had a lot of pump failures and we had a lot of injector failures and it was blamed on the lubricity, that once the sulfur cut out, then the lubricity disappeared because of the sulfur. Well, sulfur, no. Sulfur is a very, very abrasive uh, mineral. But the process that was used to remove the sulfur also removed the lubricity agents out of the fuel. That's why we had those problems. Well, our manufacturers figured that out pretty quick. Actually, so did a whole bunch of other people because we had additives like you wouldn't believe come out of the woodwork. I mean, if you wanted to buy it, I'd sure as hell sell it to you, all right? And there's no regulation on additives. We actually have a gentleman coming in tomorrow morning who was going to give a presentation on additives. He works for the Bioenergy Center here, so he's dealt a lot with additives. Um, you probably get a lot of questions about additives. I get probably about twice a week I get a phone call about additives. It's a very hot topic, all right, and something you guys do need to know about. So he's going to come in and give a presentation on that, okay? So... The, the manufacturers now, the diesel manufacturers, well, in 2007, we went from 30 parts per million to 15 parts per million. That's where we're kind of at right now, of, of sulfur. Okay, so 0.0015%, all right? I, a couple of years ago, I heard rumblings on from Federal Hill. I'm on a list of a lot of different uh, e-newsletters that they were gonna cut that in half again. Haven't heard a whole lot about that lately. Um, so I guess if they do, they do. There's not a damn thing we can do about it. But because of the, um, the sulfur is at a point now where it is meeting all of the emissions requirements for off-highway and on highway, okay? Um, cetane number. That is a number that is, uh, um, I guess, regulated again by the federal government. Um, it is basically a measure of the ignition quality of the fuel. Now this is where we can make some fuel savings, okay? This is where we're gonna talk about getting a bang for your buck. In North America, <clears throat> the minimum number for cetane is a number of 40. Average in North America is around about between 45 and 47, so we're actually doing pretty gosh darn good on our cetane number. 
What that means is when we, well actually we're not going to do anything, when the fuel pump or when the fuel gets injected into that combustion chamber, it's atomized under high pressure into teeny, so I have this bunch of fuel going in, and it's all atomized in these teeny little droplets. Okay? If I have a cetane number of 40, and I'm just going to kind of pick numbers out here, right? It might take four milliseconds for that fuel to start burning. All right? Just picking numbers. If I have a fuel with a cetane number of 47, it might only take two milliseconds for that fuel to burn. That's called ignition lag. Okay? So the shorter that lag, the more time I physically have to burn that fuel. If it starts burning earlier, okay, you know, when that piston's coming up at 2,000 RPM, it's going to keep on doing that at so many milliseconds, all right? When we inject that fuel, I physically have a short amount of time to burn that fuel. So if I have a higher cetane number, that means I have a, a shorter time it's going to start burning, therefore longer time that it can completely burn. Does that make sense? So now my emissions goes down. I'm dumping in $3.60 gallon fuel. I'm going to get a better burn of that fuel. My engine becomes more powerful, becomes more efficient. All right. My temperatures go up. My cooling system's fine. We'll talk about the cooling system later to dispel that uh, heat. And we're going to get more power of our engine. Right? That kind of makes sense. All right. This is something that your customers, or excuse me, your, your ag producers can get from their supplier. Their, the suppliers is required to keep uh, paperwork on a little, all their fuel deliveries, one of which is their cetane number. If their cetane, if you have a customer with a low power complaint, you know what, I went out last spring and last fall and that tractor run just fine when I had to plow on the ground, I was doing my seating, you know, whatever. This spring, it's just, it's just the power's not there. All right? So, do you think I should replace my fuel pump and my injectors? Well, the first answer you do is obviously no. All right? <laughs> Because if we start replacing injectors, we're going to look at some injectors, a rebuilt, um, you know, you're familiar with the Ford Power Stroke, a rebuilt injector in that fuel system is 180 bucks. I'm going to show you an injector in engines with $2,000, and your customers have them, for one injector. So do we want to replace injectors? No, we don't. All right, now that's just the injector, that's not the labor to take the old one out and put the new one in. Okay. So, a lot of it could be back to the quality of the fuel. So we're going to spend a little bit of time now talking about the quality of our fuel. One of those issues is cetane number. If that cetane number is lower, then it's going to take longer to burn the fuel, even though we're injecting it at the same pressure and the same time, it's going to take longer to burn the fuel. If I can't burn the fuel when that piston goes up before it starts coming back down, I'm wasting fuel and I'm not creating the horsepower. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Handling and storage is a huge, huge issue. Absolutely huge. Okay. Uh, water and fuel is obviously an absolute no-no. All right. One of the best metal cutting agents known to man is high pressure water. All right. In the bottom of the injector, there's these teeny, teeny little holes. So two things are going to atomize the fuel. Number one is pressure, all right? So when the fuel pressure, when that plunger comes down, that injector, whatever. The second thing is what we call a defined flow area. And that's those teeny, teeny little holes in the bottom of the injector. So when you force that pressurized fuel through those teeny holes, it explodes into millions upon millions of these teeny little droplets. All right, if I have a fuel injector running at 35,000 PSI with fuel, that's a good thing. If I have an injector running at 35,000 PSI that has a mix of water in there, you think that injector tip's going to get screwed up? Mm. Oh, I'm thinking so. All right, we're going to start cutting the living crap out of those teeny little holes. Once I start cutting those, the crap out of those little holes, am I going to explode that chunk of fuel into those teeny little droplets? No. So what just happened with my efficiency? Went out the back door, didn't it? All right. So efficiency goes down, emissions goes up, our bang for the buck went out the back door, low power complaint, et cetera, et cetera. All right. The first, you know, when I was in business, I had a low power complaint. The first thing my customer wanted to do was to re replace the injectors or the fuel pump of the ECM. Well, injectors, 2,000 bucks a pop. Okay. 
Fuel pump, you know, could be $2,000 for a fuel pump. ECM, yeah, we're talking three to $5,000. So I told them, I said, well, if you want to pay for it up front, I'll do it. But do you think maybe we should talk about some other things first? You know, and the nice thing about a small town, you learn your customers. And you guys probably have learned a lot about your ag producers. Some of them have some exceptionally good habits. Some maybe not quite so good habits, all right? This one here is a big one, handling of the fuel and storing it. So my, my customers would store their fuel in the above ground tank. You know, the fuel hole in the above ground tank is supposed to have a cap on it, right? Oh, uh, we lost that, that you know, a couple of years ago. ago. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> okay. Really just have rags. There's a rag. Yeah, stuff that rag there. Yeah, exactly. And then hope it doesn't get in the tank. Exactly. But I mean, you usually have a saturated rag sitting up top. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, saturated with the bucket. Sometimes the bucket. Well, the bucket's a bit of nothing. A bit of rag. Okay. So now we've got mice and birds, and we've got water and all kinds of crap getting in that fuel. All right, where's that fuel going to end up? It's going to end up in the fuel tank of the, of the vehicle, a piece of equipment, okay? We do have fuel filters, all right? But fuel filters are not the best, you know, um, um, depending upon the quality of your filter, we're going to talk about fuel filters. As mundane as that may sound, you know, there's some filters that the only thing I'll buy them for is for target practice. Others I will absolutely put on my engine, okay? Is there a time? Does time do anything to the fuel? Yeah, oh yeah. I'm just coming to that. That's good. That's good. Hold that, just hold that thought. Okay. okay. Hot sun, cold winter. Um, if you're heading out of town and you go through Big Sandy, when you hit the, this, this end of the town, you'll find district number three of the, of the, uh, the road district. If you look up on your right hand side, you'll see there above Grand Tank, and it has a little roof over it. That's outstanding. That is something that your customer, your, your I'm just going to keep the with you customer, all right? Your ag producers need to do. If they have an above ground tank, is they need to put over a little roof. The reason for that is during the manufacture of the diesel fuel, hydrocracking, distilling, whatever the manufacturer does, they put in a thing called a high fraction. High fractions are very expensive. A high fraction will boil off in sunlight. So if you have an above, your, your, your ag producer has an above ground tank that is in direct sunlight, it gets nice and toasty warm. I mean, have in Montana, we hit 100 degrees occasionally, as do most of Montana. That fuel will warm up. When those high fractions boil off, guess what? That cetane number goes to heck in a handbasket. So, so now, now we, we talk, talk about the efficiency and the bang for your buck, et cetera, et cetera. It all goes down. So what is... Right? Painting your tank white do? Uh, it will reflect some, some of the heat, heat but no, not, not, not enough. enough. Okay. Not enough. Steve, do you happen to have some numbers that maybe we could share with producers? Because I know some of them are going to look at me and say, Bill, you want me to do what? Build a roof over my fuel tank? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I, I can, can probably dig and come, come up with some numbers to justify that. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so is that the same as? having the tractor just set with fuel in the system for, yep. you know, I mean, once they're done using it for a moment. You park it out in the yard by the, the tree line? The yard and then absolutely, easily. absolutely. Yeah. Bigger, well, let's think about that. You know, a lot of your fuel tanks are now black, you know, the black plastic. You think that's going to suck in some heat? <laughs> Ooh, yeah. All right. The only white tank I know of is probably the, the big buds. Everything else is every other color under the rainbow. And they're not going to reflect any heat whatsoever. Absolutely. So yeah, those high fractions are going to boil off. Your CT number is going to go down. So that's going to lead to, to low power and efficiency. It could also lead to hard starting. All right, if you lose that CT number, especially on a colder morning, um, we're relying on the heat of that compressed air to ignite that fuel. If my engine's cold, then it's going to take a while to ignite that fuel. Right? So we could have a hard starting issue. And we're going to talk a little about that. That could be tied in with your filters, could be tied in with your electrical system. All right, we'll talk about that a little later too. Okay. The other thing about this one is, is a cold winter. Okay. So we, you know, some of our winter days where the sunshine gets, you know, it gets kind of reasonably warm, right? What about condensation? It's water, right? And if I have a little bit of water inside of a steel tank, 
a little bit of oxygen. What does that all measure up to? Rust. Now we have rust in our tank. Crap. All right. Most of your semi trucks are aluminum tanks, right? Rust really is an issue. Water condensation, yeah. Most of your larger tractors, your loaders, etc., they're steel tanks. You think rust is going to be an issue there? You better believe it. Okay, big time issue. Okay. So what I was telling my customers is that <clears throat> you don't quit at night and then get up in the morning and fill up your fuel tank. You fill up your fuel tank at night, get that thing full so we can reduce, you'll never eliminate condensation, but you can reduce it, okay? Um, <clears throat> the other thing about this storage, uh, most of your producers uh, will buy their fuel in bulk. All right, might be, you know, I, one of my producers bought 12,000 gallons at a time. All right, just wrote the check out, lasted him two or three years, but you know, he saved up enough money, he got a bulk discount, and life was good. The only issue he ran into was that you know, your diesel fuel is a natural substance. It has a few additives in that, you know, but basically it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's not synthetic. So microorganisms are going to grow in there. So if, you're, if, if they're storing fuel in a tank <laughs> above or below ground, ground or also in their combines and their tractors, whatever, over the winter time, they should be treating their fuel with a biocide. Okay? I had, when I was in business, I had two instances where we had excessive microorganism growth. Trust me, you will know it if you have it. Because when you spin that fuel filter off, it damn near makes you puke. It's an extremely rancid, disgusting smell. Okay? If there, if, um, when we talk about fuel filters, we'll come back to this, but I always cut open my fuel filter, or my customer fuel filters, or fuel filters, whatever. And sometimes, one instance was covered with a green slime, and oh my god, did it stink. I knew exactly what it was. The second instance, it didn't smell quite so bad, it was covered with a black slime. Well, that was actually, the green slime was live microbes, and the black one was the dead ones, because we treated the fuel tank. Okay? So that can stop plugging out fuel filters. So now we're back to low power. Got nothing to do with the injectors. Got nothing to do with the, the fuel pump. It's got everything to do if we didn't treat the damn fuel because we've got now got microorganisms there. Both those instances I actually put on um, with a fuel that is above ground tanks on a stand. We actually put in a double filter system coming out of the tank, and then we regularly had to change the filters on. The, they're actually both four drive tractors, two different customers. All right. So that's where you're gonna. We actually went with cheaper filters, but we got most of the the, the crap out of the tank. Okay. So. Treating with a biocide is a good thing. So injectors are, I mean, you don't have to replace them as much as people think is what you're saying. No. No. Because, no. I, I mean, I know in my Ford pickup, I have uh, an injector that I think sticks. Because a lot of times I don't have the power. But then once it gets kind of cleaned out of there, is, is that a, is, is is that that a power stroke? Yeah. Okay, that's a Huey system. I'll, I'll show you that injector. I actually have a Huey head and a cutaway down below. We'll, we'll look at that. Um, it could be the injector. Um, it could be wiring connections. But I don't really yeah. want to replace them because of the price. That one, your rebuilt's about 180 bucks on that one. For an injector, isn't it? Yeah, for one injector, yeah. And yeah. No, absolutely not. How do you know which one? Uh, we'll talk a little about this later, but that's a good question. The really, really, the, so back in the day, we had totally mechanical engines, transmissions, brake systems, whatever. There's basically no electric. The electrical system was the starter in our lights, basically, right? And the steering air conditioner. Nowadays, we have freaking sensors everywhere, <laughs> all right? The, the new systems, you know, your engine ECM is controlling the fueling of the engine. But it's looking at the engine itself, all the sensors on there, it's looking at ambient air temperature, it's looking at turbo boost, it's looking at your braking system, it's looking at your transmission, it's looking at your vehicle speed sensors, et cetera, et cetera. It's all going into that information, all right? So the downside of that is we have a crap load of wiring and sensors now. Okay. The upside to answer your question is we can do a whole lot of diagnosing through a scan tool. 
All right. Well, I've scanned it and nothing comes. So there's no codes coming up? No codes coming up. Did down. you, have you done a cylinder cutout test or an injector cutout test? Okay, that's what you need to do. And your scan tool probably won't do that. That's probably going to be a, a dealership item. Uh, we, we have like a Mac mentor here. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's probably what you're looking at to get that software yeah. so you can do that. Yeah, yeah. They'll have to get in with their NGK tool. That's a Ford uh, scan tool where they can actually um, go in and, and do a, a cutout test. So basically what they're doing is they're just, uh, they're commanding the ECM to go through a cycle where it's going to cut out one injector at a time and it's going to look at what all the other injectors are doing. So if I cut out number one and you know, the other seven do their thing, I cut out number two, the other seven do the same thing. But if one is out of, out of, out of sequence or out of scope, then it will identify there's possibly a failure with that injector. Could be the injector, it could be just the wiring. You know, it could be, a, you know, that's what people always think is it could be the injector, it could be the fuel pump. Well, let's talk about wiring connections. Let's talk about, you know, where the wiring goes through the, the valve cover. And we're just getting shaken. It's easier to run wild for a long period of time when, it, when it's warm, when it gets cold. It seems to have one that, that seems like it catches, but then once it warms up. Does it always, does it always seem like in the same position on the engine? Can you yeah. kind of tell if it's like, you know, one up front on the right bank or rear lift? I can't tell or? That, but it seems like it, yeah. it's the same. Okay. Because it's always in third gear. Well, could we tie any transmission then? <laughs> well, I have no transmission, so. Yeah. Like so because your, your, your ECM is looking at what your transmission is doing as well. Yeah, so I, I would recommend, yeah, maybe it's going to be a couple of miles, but you might want to get to a dealership and maybe have them run through their their software. Yeah, yeah. Those are good questions. Good questions. Okay. Um, so, how much does one gallon of number two diesel weigh? <laughs> God, I love asking <laughs> questions. Come on, Tim. <laughs> okay, I have 7.2. Do I have any advances on 7.2? 7.8. Oh, we're, we're creeping up. I guess 7.2 and 7.8. Come on, Nicole, jump into the mix here. Come on. <sighs> Throw me a number, kiddo. Okay, we'll go. I'll split it. I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> One dollar. Okay. One dollar. <laughs> I'll go 0.75. 7.5? Sorry. Yeah. Point seven five. We got some serious <laughs> problems. Yeah, that would be glad you said it. Yeah. Hey, what are you basing that number on? Well, at one point I knew it might have been weighed, but it's also going to be less than water at eight. So. Okay. That's not the end of my knowledge. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, that's Nicole, because she just loved the difference. So. <laughs> okay. We have what, seven, eight, nine, including me. So we could go out to the web and we could Google. Actually, I don't use Google because it sucks. I use Bing, that's the best one. <laughs> Google's in trouble, right? It's yeah, like yeah. <laughs> so we could either Google or Bing or go to ask.com. How much does one gallon of diesel fuel weigh? And I guarantee you, everyone in this room, including me, would get about 20 different answers. I have seen anywhere from 6.5 to 7.8 on the web, all right? Industry standard is 7.2, 7.3 pounds per gallon. But that's, that is a number to me is totally meaningless, all right? The reason I say that is because I have physically weighed fuel. And that's what you guys need to do, tell your agricultural producers. If your fuel is down at 6.5 pounds per gallon, you have some seriously low quality fuel. So now let's talk about, go back and talk about efficiency and talk about low horsepower and talk about excess emissions and sucky numbers for bang for your buck. If your fuel is weighing up to 7.2, 7.5, whatever, you got some good fuel. So your low power concern from your ag producer your high emissions, or your, you know, we're not getting many hours per gallon or whatever. It's got nothing to do with the injectors, it's got nothing to do with the fuel pump, it's got nothing to do with anything except, except that they have got low quality fuel. So is that a distributor problem or is that a storage problem or a combination? Could be a little bit of everything. Yeah. How long it's sat. How long it's sat, yeah. Okay. So what I did, and 
you can tell your ag producers, they can all do this. I wouldn't recommend you tell it in front of their wives because they're going to drag out the wise bathroom scale and they're going to weigh again. Stop <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> they're going to weigh a gallon of diesel fuel. I mean, they've got the tools right there. A gallon milk jug and a bathroom scale. I've done it a bazillion times. All right. One of the lab objectives of my first year, actually my first year in my senior level fuel class, is they get a sample of fuel and they weigh it. And they all say, well, it's going to be 7.3 or 7.2. Okay, prove it to me. It turns out it's 6.8. Like, ooh, shit. Okay, <laughs> it's pretty surprising. And the, the variation is across the board. But if you know that you have good quality fuel, you know, <coughs> let's say it's weighing up at 7.7 .7 pounds per gallon. We know that we've got the spec sheet from the supplier. We've got a good CT number, the ash level's low, et cetera, et cetera. Well, our low power complaint and, and low, you know, or high use fuel usage has got nothing to do with the fuel, right? It's got something that might be mechanical. It could be a whole lot of things. We've eliminated the fuel. A lot of your problems will go back to the fuel, okay? So, you know, a lot of producers order fuel in bulk. Correct. And, I mean, what are they doing a large amount of core fuel? What do they do with them? <coughs> that's a very good question. Well, actually, that's what they would do. Yeah. You know, there's, and, you know, tomorrow morning you find out that, you know, I, I could pour coffee into a, uh, into a jug, and I can put a fancy label on it, and if you want to buy it, I'll sure as hell sell it to you as a fuel additive, because there's no federal regulations on that, okay? Yeah. So you got to be very discerning about what your additive is, all right? And we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow morning. But to get back to your question, if you have 5,000 gallons of, of, of fuel that's weighing 6.8 pounds per gallon, I'm sure as hell not just going to open the faucet and just let it drain on the ground, all right? Times $4 a gallon. That ain't going to happen. So my recommendation would be that you would, would, would do your homework. You would go back to your supplier <laughs> and maybe get some test samples from your supplier. Uh, the spec sheets from the supplier and see what the spec sheets are, all right? Maybe it got contaminated before the supplier got it, but that's something that your egg producer and your suppliers, but they're going to have to probably dicker back and forth and figure out what the hell we're going to do about this low-quality fuel. We had an instance um, north of Haver about four years ago, and it was actually a local supplier, but it wasn't the local supplier's fault. Um, they, there was one guy, one ag producer had a hard starting, uh, his tractor was hard starting, and his combine, everything. And so they bought the sample of fuel in here. We actually, know, I'll, I'll give you guys a tour of the test facility. But they did what was called a flashpoint test. So they put this fuel in a machine and close the door, specific sample, and it heats it up and it finds out what temperature that fuel lights off at. Well, this, this fuel was, there's actually an alarm on this little tester. So you shut the door and this little sniffer does a little sniff test. It wouldn't even fire the flame up to warm the fuel. The alarm went off, it shut the machine down completely. It's too dangerous because the fuel was laced with gasoline. And it was not the local supplier's fault. Well, it is, they just kind of found out that the neighbor had the same problem. And he got his fuel from the same supplier. So they went back to the supplier, and the supplier was actually like two steps down from the supplier where they found what the problem was. So they ended up actually sucking those, that fuel out of those tanks, and they sent it back to where it came from. They said, you guys deal with it. We're not. And by the way, if you don't want to, well, here's the number of my lawyer. So they're, they're the supplier, supplier of the supplier took the fuel back. I don't know, they probably re-refined it, did whatever they had to do. But, you know, you know, they took care of the problem. So it goes back, you know, you, you do your own homework, or your, your egg producer, then they need to start going back down the food chain and find out where the issue came about, okay? Because you're not going to dump, I don't care if it's 10 gallons or 10,000 10, gallons, you know, we're, we're not going to dump that number one on the ground anyway. But number two, we bought it to burn. Well, if we can't burn it, we need to get to replace it with stuff we can burn. Yeah, okay. Good, Good questions. questions. So this is one that your, your egg producers can do. Just get out the bathroom scale, weigh a sample. And if it's not up to snuff, then we start looking why not, okay? We will talk about a lot more about the fuel system components later. Okay. Let's go up and move around.
Number one, clear. Number one, dyed. Number two, clear. Number two, dyed. The dye is just essentially is food coloring. That's all you need to know about that, okay? Number one and number two, however, yeah, we have a little bit of a difference. Um, number two is predominantly what your egg producers are going to run in their diesel equipment, all right? It's uh, cheaper than number one. Uh, it has more what we call BTUs, which is British Thermal Unit, so that's energy, so it's a higher heat value, so it burns a whole lot better, so it's a lot more economical for them to run, okay? However, in Haver, Montana, middle of winter, it gets kind of chilly, okay? So the big difference between number one and number two is what we call the pour point, the cloud point, and the gel point, okay? So, cloud point of number one and number two is essentially uh, when, so in our fuel we have these little wax crystals and the, the cloud point is actually where those wax crystals start conglomerating and the, the, the fuel actually looks cloudy or hazy, that's why it's called the cloud point. So the cloud point, and I can't remember offhand what the temperatures are, but number two the cloud point is a lot higher than number one. Therefore, it, number one is more suited for colder climate. Right? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Number one, yes. The pore point is defined by industry as the lowest temperature at which fuel can be pumped through the fuel system. All right? And that is typically is about 5 to 10 degrees lower than the cloud point. All right, so we can still put that through fuel through the fuel system. The, the, the cloud, the, the pour point of number one is lower than number two. Therefore, again, it's better for colder climates. Gel point is a point where you don't want to be. Okay, gel point is when our fuel, as the term would suggest, it gels. You're not going anywhere, okay? So you cannot pump the fuel through the system. So without putting <coughs> two in the additives, do those additives that say that they drop the... Yep, I'm getting to that. Good really question. Work. Yep. Uh, some do. Some of those additives work. Some don't worth it. Yeah. But yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that. It's a good question, okay? So yeah, we're talking about straight fuel, <laughs> but yeah, we'll talk about additives for sure. <coughs> um, if your customer or your, your ag producers get to gel point, well, that's when you know, you're getting a hook and you're getting into the shop, getting it warmed up, etc. Okay. When, if we go back to the cloud point, when those wax crystals conglomerate because of the cold weather, even though we warm that fuel back up, those wax crystals stay conglomerated. There's no way of unconglomerating just by warming the fuel up. Okay. So the, one of the issues with that is uh, those wax crystals will start to plug up your fuel filters. So now we're going to have low power complaints, we're going to have high fuel usage, we're going to have no bang for our buck, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The other issue too is if it's on a newer fuel system, um, filters, we'll, we'll talk more about this in a minute, filters go by what's called a micron rating. And a micron rating, there's two ways of looking at it. Number one, the first way, is the size of the holes in the filter media. The other way of looking at it is the size of the dirt that gets trapped in the filter, all right? On your newer fuel systems, especially a high pressure common rail, the micron rating for a final filter, typically it's gonna be two fuel filters on a diesel engine, okay? The final filter, right before it goes into the ejection apparatus, is two microns. That is gosh darn small. That is extremely small. One of my old gray hairs is about 40 microns. All right, so two is like, you know, really small. Water will actually plug a five micron filter. You cannot get water through a five micron filter. That's why we're gonna get that water the hell out of that fuel. All right, we'll talk more about that later as well, okay? Now, to answer your question about the additives, so the, the pour point and the, <coughs> the cloud point, pour point and gel point, can be lowered with the use of the correct additive. And I want to stress the word correct. As I said before, if I get a pop bottle and I pour some coffee in there, put a lid on it, put a fancy ass label, if you want to buy it, I'll sure as hell sell it to you. That's not going to be a problem. There's no federal regulations on what's on that label. Okay? I, I sell that to you and I tell you it's an anti-gel, it's you know, going to do whatever. 
and you put it in your pickup truck, or your ag tractor, or a swath or whatever, and then you say, well, it gelled up on me. You lied to me. Well, I said, well, no, I didn't, Nicole. It worked in my pickup. It worked in my buddy's pickup. So I'm off the hook. All right? So when you're looking at additives, or when you're talking to your, your ag producers about them, please be very, very careful. Um, we, <coughs> the Bioenergy Center here has a cold filter plugging point, CFCC, CFPP machine. Put a sample of fuel in, put the additive in, and then they actually take it down in steps and actually cool the fuel off and see if the additive actually works. They purchased about, I think it was, well, pretty much every type of additive for fuel that was available in Haver, Montana for diesel, right, just in the local area. 14 of those said they're anti-gel. Four of them worked. Okay, the other 10, well, let's not worry about those ones because they didn't work. Okay, power service, Howie's, Standardine, crap, I can't remember the fourth one. Howie's actually worked the best. That's the one I used to sell. Luckily, he didn't know at the time, but it worked pretty damn good. <laughs> okay, and Howie's actually worked the best for, you talked about biodiesel, worked the best for biodiesel as well, which is a whole different realm of what your egg producer is going to start getting into. Nicole, Nicole question? Um, just out of curiosity with that machine, can they test to see if one works better than another or just like yeah, because it goes by temperature. But yeah, because you get that, the four recommendations, but out of those four, just out of curiosity, is there one that they thought was Oh, the four that worked? Yeah. Yeah, I think they have the temperatures recorded of what they actually started to, to haze at and what they started to, the pour point and then started to gel. But I'm not sure what those temperatures were. But yeah, you, we could, if, if I can get that data, we could, you could compare those, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we'll, so... It seems that like power services does a lot better marketing than, yeah. than the other one, the right. Howie's. Yeah, and, and Howie's, it just happened that I leased a, a, uh, um, a service station where I did my, some of my work at, and he sold Howie's, so I just kind of kept on selling Howie's. Didn't know at the time, it was a pretty damn good one to sell. I had no idea at the time, though. But with, with additives, it's buyer beware. You know, um, uh, when we look at additives tomorrow, I'll bring a box in and I'll just have you guys look at some of those labels. And I mean, some of the claims on those labels are like, are you freaking kidding me? You know, it works on both gasoline and diesel. They're two totally different fuels. How can it work on both? It removes the moisture. Well, the only way to remove it is actually just to you know, distill it out of there. We're not going to remove any damn moisture at all. I mean, we, so it's claims. It's, so you've got to really read those labels very, very closely. The other thing that I make my students do, too, is, you know, they, uh, I'll, I'll give you a handout. It's actually uh, uh, how labels or how fuel additives are rated or classified, I guess is a better term. Um, so uh, cold weather performance, uh, engine performance, all that sort of stuff. They have to go through and, and you know, go through, look at all the labels and write down the little thing. But then I want them to choose one additive and I want them to get out onto the web and see if there's any justification for what's on that label. So look at manufacturers' websites, uh, diesel forums, all kinds of places. Your ag producers can do exactly the same thing. The web is a fantastically huge resource. It really is. And they need to be using that. Okay, so they go out, they see this additive, they can just get their notepad out and write down what's on there, get out to the web and see if there is any um, scientific data. Right? I'm, I'm big on data. And if I go out to the web and, well, we're good on my buddy's pickup, well, that doesn't mean a darn thing to me. But you know what? If this company had an independent research come in and they did a bunch of testing like this lab here, and they said, yeah, it does what the label said it did, I'm good to go with that. All right. So again, you're also going to be discerning about what your source of your information is as well. Okay. So what do you think about seafoam? That's that's marketed. Mm -hmm. what, I mean, very. It's rated. now for carbureted engines. Man, does that stuff clean. It actually cleans a little bit too good. I've ruined more than one carburetor by using that stuff. Um, for as far as an anti-gel and all that, no, it failed miserably. So that's one that says gas and diesel. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, it, it, it does clean very, very well, actually. It cleans a little too well. I mean, it's, um, you get that on your paint, and it's going to peel the paint off type of thing. Um, I use it a lot of gasoline engines. Um, the top end, put some in the fuel, some in the oil, and some down the, like the carburetor. 
and it actually cleaned some, some of those old carburetors, the gunk's actually plugging up the, you know, where the, the old rings are wore out type of thing. You get that gunk out of there, now we've got a massive air leaks and it pretty much ruined the carburetors. So it's very good for cleaning injectors, to my knowledge. But as far as, you know, there's all those claims on that label, um, most of those claims are unfounded. But what about, like, injectors on your diesel? Those? It, <coughs> it would probably clean them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, correct, yeah. correct, yeah, yeah. And most of your additives that you'll find are gonna be, they're not just an anti dial they're not just an injector cleaner, they're, they're multiple, you know? So if you find one that says it's bona fide anti-gel, that's good, but also look at what else is on there as well. So if it's gonna, uh, a detergent, that's good, because that's gonna clean your injectors, your fuel system, your fuel pump, et cetera, okay? Uh, might have a stabilizer in it, or an antibacterial, you know, all those things to put it together. The other thing I'll tell you about additives is if you're, you or your, or your ag producer decide to use them, read how much that will treat, what the treatment rate is. You know, if you use a quart and 200 gallons, well, that's good. Also, two quarts must be better, right? Uh, no, not necessarily, <laughs> okay? More is not better. So make sure that you, you, your customer or your, your ag producers do follow what's on those labels. Nicole. So I guess my next question would be, um, I know some of them just try to throw in a bottle of like Sanodyne, um, for example, with every time they fuel it up, especially when it gets colder. When you're starting to throw in some of those other components like the detergent to clean it out and that kind of stuff, um, is there going to be a problem with using too much additives on that type of regular of a yep. basis? Mm -hmm. Yep, there will be. Okay. When the, the manufacturers, when they hydro crack or distill or whatever they do to make the fuel, they, they put in additives as well. All right, your fuel, your, your oil uh, it has additives in it, your coolant has additives. You start, I am not a proponent of additives. I'm really not. Um, I've never used an oil additive. I never will use an oil additive. Um, I have used fuel additives, but that's really about as far as I go. The reason is, this is what you're saying, if you overdo, you know, two cans instead of one, for example, you have totally messed up that whole additive package that came with that bottle, but came with that fuel or the oil or whatever. So when you mess that up, then that oil or the coolant or the fuel, it's not going to do what it's supposed to do. It can't, all right, because that, that whole balance has been messed up. So that's where you got to be very careful about what additives you put in. So, I mean, if that little bottle of standard ion says it treats 20 gallons and they put in 20 gallons, that's fine. Yeah, I'd go with that. But I, if he has a bottle that treats 30 gallons, he puts in 10 gallons every time and puts a bottle in, uh, I'm thinking not. No. Yeah. You just, just pretty much go with what the, the manufacturer wants you to do. Loving their equipment too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go to the local gas station and they're selling you a diesel blend, is that a number one and number two? Typically it's a 50-50 mix, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's a good question. Yeah, so in the wintertime, <coughs> um, number one, clear is extremely expensive fuel. Extremely expensive. Um, most of the manufacturers that for a winter, of what they call a winter blend, would be a 50-50 mix of one and two. And typically they'll have a, um, probably an extra anti-gel additive in there as well, is what I've found. Yeah. Okay, great questions, guys. Okay, anything else on this slide?